Thank you very much, Lady Wolf, for your kind words. I am deeply honored for this invitation. It is a real pleasure for me to be with you all today, if only virtually. Uh, I try now to share my screen. I prepared um, a PowerPoint. Customs litigation and papal decretals of Scotland and the development of the European Jus Commune in the 12th and 13th century. The legal renaissance of the 12th century and the process of formation of a European Jus Commune are at the origin of developments that have determined the characters of Western legal culture. Since the dawn of the story, of this story, Scotland took part in this movement of ideas and civilization. The title of my paper presents Scotland and Jus Commune as the two terms of a mutual relationship. It is not my task to track down the many links by which this relationship was formed and evolved over the centuries. But I would like to point that I will not use words like influence or reception, which historians often employ to describe the relational processes such as those on which I will focus. Categories of this sort refer to relations between objects well defined at the start, one of which, considered statically, undergoes a change from the other. For this reason, I will not speak of influence of the jus commune on medieval Scots law or of reception of the jus commune into medieval Scots law. Instead of speaking of Scots law, I will speak of law in Scotland in the 12th and 13th centuries. My investigation aims at appreciating how the jus commune shaped from the inside the formation of a legal system that over the centuries would assume its peculiar and distinctive characters. I intend to point out that the ecclesiastical jurisdiction, papal decretals, and more in general, canon law, were the primary channels through which between the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century, Scotland approached the legal culture of the use commune. Two dates and two historical facts seem to me emblematic and can be taken as chronological limits of my discussion. In 1152-53, the Bishop of St. Andrews, Robert, joined the Abbey of Loch Leven to the Augustinian Priory of St. Andrews handing over to the, to the priory all the goods of the abbey, including a small but significant collection of books. These included the Excepciones Ecclesiasticarum Regularum, that is, the famous prologue of Ivo of Chart, which circulated along with his collections, Decretum and Panorchia. At the middle of the 12th century, Scotland was therefore already immersed in the process of the circulation of the books on which the science of canon law was being built. Although research is still to be done, it is not to be doubted that by the mid 12th century, also Gratian's Decretum and then the Decretal collections were circulating in Scotland, since these books were indispensable working tools for the ecclesiastical administration. The training and the acquisition of skills in the legal field, both in the canon law and in the civil law, and the formation of a professional class of lawyers are phenomena that clearly appeared between the end of the 12th century and the first decades of the 13th. In 1233-34, three judges delegate of Pope Gregory IX pronounced a judgment in a case related to the monastery of Paisley. The judges reported that they had delivered the judgment, I quote, 
with the advice of prudent men experienced in the canon as well in the civil law. Regium Majestatem, a reliable witness of the Scottish legal practice, it is necessary to define the scenario within which the documents that I have specifically studied are placed. It is useful to begin with a treatise Regium Majestatem. The date of composition has been variously placed between the middle of the 13th century and the years after 1380. The later date is more commonly accepted. Most of the content is taken up with adaptations to the Scottish context from the treatise Glanville. Added to these are some significant sections taken from canon law. It has been shown that these parts are taken from the Summa in Titulos Decretalium of Goffredus Tetrano, 1241-43. It is questionable to what extent the treatise reflects the practice of law in Scotland, but it is certain that the work acquired so much authority that the Parliament of 1426 included it among the books of the law of the realm. Since the first of, cases, of the cases I wish to examine concerns the patrimonial agreements between spouses, it is useful to recall some principles that Regium Majestatin states on these matters. In chapter two of book one, the author, enumerates the questions which belong to the ecclesiastical jurisdiction. They are those concerning the dos, dowry and dower, wills and the advowson of churches. This clear statement does not have textual similarities in Glanville, in which the placitum vedotibus is counted among the placita civilia dealt with in the curia domini regis. The matter of patrimonial relations between spouses is then thoroughly discussed in book two. Chapter 15, De Donationibus Inter Virum et Uxorem is one of the sections drawn from the Summa of Goffredus de Trano. In chapter 16, the daughter, the theme is introduced with the spe specification that the word dos has a double meaning. The first meaning is ascribed to a vernacular use of the term. The dos is what the husband gives the bride in front of the door of the church at the time of the marriage. This gift is explicitly linked to an obligation arising both from canon law and from secular law, use seculare. The dos, if it is not otherwise provided, is equivalent to a third of the heritage of her husband at the time of the marriage. In Glanville, and then in Re Regium Majestatem, the reference to an obligation deriving from, deriving from canon law is unequivocal. It is rather ambiguous, however, the reference to the secular law, which could in theory meant customary law as well as civil law. However, an obligation to endow one's own wife existed neither in the civil nor in canon law, except in so far as such an obligation could be framed within the category of the donatio propter nuptias. It seems likely, therefore, that in Regem Majestatem, the chapter De Donationibus Inter Virum et Uxorem, taken from Goffredus, was intended to supplement the materials concerning dower taken from Glanville. Not in order to introduce a new institution unknown to in the Scottish traditions, but to attract 
albeit implicitly, the dos or tertia or ters of the customary law within the framework of the use commune through the category of donatio proper nuptia. Chapter 18, De Donationibus per rarum in maritagium et alius us, presents the second meaning of the term dos. Here, explicit, explicit reference is made to the leges romane, according to which the dowry is the gift which is given to the husband with his wife. The principle and legal practice, cases relating to dower before Arch the Archdeacon of St. Andrews and the decretal of Innocent III. It is not the object of my investigation to ascertain to what extent the claims of Regium Majestatum as to the competence of the ecclesiastical jurisdiction concerning those reflected the actual Scottish judicial practice in the 13th or 14th centuries. However, it is certain that such cases were not unknown to the legal practice of that time. The case that I am going to look at shows that disputes concerning DOS engaged the court of the Bishop of St. Andrews in the early 13th century. Presumably in the year 1200, the Archdeacon of St. Andrews consulted Pope Innocent III on a couple of legal issues to which he could not give an adequate answer. Innocent III addressed his response to the Archdeacon. He was Ranulf de Watt. Since the years 1193 and 94, when he begins to appear in the documentation, he is called Magister, and it is possible that he had studied canon law. The decretal Nuper contains Innocent III responses to the question asked by Ranulf. They revolve around the matter of dos, but it is unclear whether they affected the two different cases actually pending before the Episcopal Court of St. Andrews, or whether they related to recurring situations over which the Archdeacon wanted to clarify his ideas. The first question arose from the following situation. A man who held a land in life rent had granted the third part, the third part of this land to his wife on account of dower. The Archdeacon doubted whether she could keep to hold that land even after her husband's death. In his consultation, the Archdeacon used the term dos in different meaning with respect to the legal category of the use commune, but in accordance with local customary practice, that is the terse. The archdeacon had been involved because the church is obliged to protect widows' dowers. This principle represented the expectation of the widow who had asked for the protection of the church and at the same time manifested an obligation which the archdeacon was aware of. The divine protection afforded to the weak, especially widows and orphans, was affirmed in the Holy Scriptures. Moreover, such protection was a primary task of the church and of the bishop as the canonical tradition attested. The most important texts were transmitted in the canonical collections before Gratian. Gratian, Gratian himself enshrined the, the principle in the introductory dictum of Distinctio 87. Gratian's decretum contains also a canon which entrusted specifically to archpriests and archdeacons the care of widows, orphans, and strangers. The second question concerns the following situation. A certain land was granted in inheritance or in fief to a man and to the male issue that he would have 
with his lawful wife. The man gave his wife a certain part of that land on account of dower and then died childless. The archdeacon was unsure whether the woman might continue to hold the land received as a, as a dower. The case is a variant of the previous one. Both problems found their solution through a regular juris that Pope Innocent III applied to the two different scenarios. For our part, I quote, we respond to your consultation in this way. Normally, no one can transfer to another large to another larger rights than he himself has. Therefore, the husband to whom the land was granted in the aforementioned manner cannot grant his wife what he himself was not allowed to possess, except during his lifetime. Nor is it lawful for his wife to keep part of the land that she owns for her husband's grant as a gift on account of marriage, unless the owner of the land gave his consent to the donatio. The widow is therefore not entitled to hold the land received on account of dower. Innocent III reaches such a conclusion by applying a regula juris by Ulpian. Nemo plus juris ad alium transferre potes quam ipse habere. The widow could keep holding the land only if the original grantor gave his consent to the grief, to the gift of the land on account of dower. It is significant, moreover, that the Pope did not hesitate to classify as donatio propter nuptias the tertia or terce of the Scots customary law by attracting such gift within the legal fig figure of the use commune. The same se regular juris should be applied to the second question put by the archdeacon. Therefore, what we say about the first consultation, we will repeat with respect to the second one. In fact, although the church has to show herself favorably disposed in cases concerning widows, however, the favor of the church should not be bestowed upon them against justice. The conclusion of the decretal has the tone of a rebuke or, or of a lesson of use commune. These, in truth, we do, not, we do not want you to ignore. According to the laws of Justinians, a wife is said to give her husband the dowry, thus, a husband is said to give his wife a gift on account of marriage, donatio proper nuptias. Probably, the Archdeacon Ranulf did not ignore the, this distinction. But the Archdeacon had been unable to take the step that Innocent III had been able to take since he was used to read the fact of experience in the light of the categories of the utrumque use. The step was to attract the dos or tertia of the customary law within the figure of the donatio proper nuptia. The decretal nuper had the fate to become itself a fragment of the use commune canonicum. It was placed first in the compilatio tertia and then in the liber extra. Along these channels, it entered the scientific circuit of medieval jurists. Through this decretal, the use commune had given an orientation to the Scottish legal practice of the 13th century. By means of the canonical collections, the same decretal could now feed the doctrinal debate. The body of exegetical materials coming from the lectures of the decretals allowed some jurists endowed with particular synth synthesis skills to develop systematic treatises uh, like the Summe. A characteristic common to the most important Summe composed in the 13th century of Fredus Letrani, Enricus of Susa, is the constant, I would say, normal use of Roman law in the reconstruction of the legal issues. These summa are the expression of the fusion of the canon law and the civil law in the system of the utrumque use. The unknown compiler of Regium Maestatum, 
used the, used the Summa of Goffredus to make up his own treatise. If we take for good that the work was made around 1318, in theory, the author could have put to use also the Summa of Ostiensis. So why did he use the Summa of Goffredus? One can only give hypothetical answers. Maybe the choice was fortuitous because only the Summa of Goffredus was available to him. Indeed, this Summa had a wide dissemination in the mid Middle Ages. Nowadays, we know of 280 manuscripts of the Summa, some of which are also preserved in Scottish library. Or maybe the choice was deliberate. In fact, the Summa of Goffredus stands out for synthesis and clarity. Goffredus was able to deal with the most difficult legal problems with great efficacy and reasonable brevity. It seems to me that the choice of the unknown compiler of Regium Majestatim to insert a title, the Donationibus Intervirum et Uxorem, immediately before the title, De Dote, becomes understandable. The author, the author had, in general, a legal culture based on the use commune. He knew the Liber Extra in which the decretal nuper was included. He knew the Summa of the Fredus, where the decretal was, was taken into account in the exposition concerning the Donatio Propter Nuptias. The title de dote, as we have seen, of the, of the title de dote of Regium Majestatem concerns the marital donation, otherwise known as, as Ters. This was in his source, Glanville, and in the Scottish customs. The author of Regium Majestatim, Majestatim per performed a cultural operation that stood, albeit implicitly, in the wake of the interpretative processes of the jurists of the Jus Commune in the 13th century. Without rejecting the differences between the Dos Tertia and the Donatio Propter Nuptias, but seizing the substantial functional similarity of the two gifts, he wanted to attract the figure originating in the, originating in the customary law into the sphere of the, the use comune. By using the title on Donatio Propter Nuptias, he wanted to offer his readers a tool that would allow them to frame a Scottish custom, use proprium, within the system of the use commune. The story express, expresses in a concrete way the sense of what Baldus Deubaldis, referring back to the teaching of Bartolus, said about the force of attraction, virtus attractiva, of the use commune on the use proprium. I quote, Bartolus says that the statutes receive a passive interpretation, not active. This means that the jus commune gives shape to the statutes and clothes them, but does not receive shape or is clothed, clothed by them. And this is the force of the attraction, virtus attractiva, that the jus commune has on the jus municipale but the opposite does not happen. Issues on Roman canonical, canonical procedure in a decretal of Innocent III concerning a Scottish case. The first 10 chapters of the second book of Regium Majestatum focus on arbitration and compromise. This part is a substantial addition to the bulk of the work provided by Glanville. As it is well known, these chapters are taken with some adaptations from the Summa of Goffredus de Trano. The author wanted to offer his readers a concise and reliable guide on a method of dispute set settlements that the sources attest to have been widely practiced in Scotland in the 13th century. On the assumption that the agreement of the parties is the foundation of arbitration, in a note, in a note, additional note to marginal note to Regium Majestatem, John Skeen observed 
that the arbiter can do nothing beyond what he has been granted in the compromise. Skin conveniently recalled two converging sources of the use commune in which this principle was clearly formulated. A fragment of the digest and the chapter of the Liber Extra placed in the, in the title the, the Arbitris. The latter one is taken from the decretal cum dilectus of Innocent III, a letter by which the pontiff resolved some procedural issues emerging from a very intricate Scottish case. The decretal concerns a lawsuit between the abbot and the canons of Can Cambus Kenneth on the one hand, and the abbot and the monks of Dunfermline on the other. The letter is a part of a wider stream of papal correspondence relating to the same case. At the time when Innocent III was writing, several points of the controversy had already been dealt with by different papal judges delegates. The parties had subsequently referred the case to the judgment of some arbiters who decided to consult the Roman See regarding some difficult and refined legal issues that emerged in the arbitration. The decretal followed into the compilatio tertia and hence into the liber extra and is addressed to the panel of arbiters to the panel of arbiters. The first is the Bishop of St. Andrews, William Malvezan, whose competences, competences in utroque iure are well known. Next to the Bishop are uh, Henry Abbott of Arbroath, Thomas Pryor of St. Andrews, as well as the Archdeacon Ranulf, whom we already know, and Magister Lo Laurentius, mentioned uh, here as officialis of the Bishop of St. Andrews. The decretal summarily reconstructs the terms of a complex dispute in which two different cases converged. A first dispute in the matter of tithes and damages was brought up by the abbot and the canon of Cambus Kenneth against the abbot and the monks of Dunfermline. On the other side, the abbot and the monks of Dunfermline had started proceedings against the abbot and canons of Cambus Kenneth regarding the ownership of a chapel and other tithes. By mandate of Innocent III, the case had been submitted to the judgment of three judges delegate. After multiple allegations and discussions, the two parties entered into a compromise with which they agreed to submit their respective claims to the arbitration of the five aforementioned addressees of the papal, papal letter. The agreement provided that the case should be decided either with a judgment or with a settlement, judicio vel concordia. Under the terms of the compromise, the arbiters had to proceed secundum juris ordinem. They heard the parties' views, listened to witness, and published their respective testimonies. However, the arbiters suspended the decision in order to ask Innocent III for instructions on four issues on which they remained in doubt. First, the monks of Dunfermline, who had been sued for a matter of tithes, wished to, wished to reconvene, uh, reconvene the canons of Cambus Kenneth before the arbiters regarding other tithe, tithes. Although this intent was not included in the compromise, the monks argued that according to the civil laws, he who is a defendant before a judge can reconvene the plaintiff before the same judge. Second, after the publication of the testimonies, the canons of Cambus Kenneth wanted to produce fur further documents that were advantage advantages to them. The monks of Dunfermline, however, argued that after the publicatio attestationum, 
neither the production of new, of new witnesses nor the production of new documents was possible. Third, the monks, for their part, asserted that the controversy regarding tithes had been settled with a concordia at the time of King David. And to answer the claims of the counterparty, they wanted to produce the document bearing the royal seal. The Bishop of St. Andrews wondered if such a document had probably force without further evidence being required as the witnesses mentioned therein were by then deceased. Lastly, the dispute concerned both the possession of assets and their ownership. The party wanted the arbiters to, to, to pronounce themselves with a single sentence. The other party wanted the possessory case to be decided in advance with the, the consequent restitution of the assets and the property case to be settled later. This story is of great interest interest regardless of the answer that Innocent III gave to the four question. The legal questions addressed to the Pope are more eloquent than the answer he gave. Above all, both the, the lawyers of the parties and the designated arbiters had clear knowledge of the Romano-canonical Romano procedure, but they also had the ability to put extremely complex questions from a procedural point of view, which in any case presupposed a non-superficial or merely practical knowledge of the procedure secundum juris ordine. They had certainly studied canon law and probably also as much of Roman law as was necessary to perform ecclesiastical office. We know nothing of their studies, whether they took place somewhere between Scotland or England, or why not, even in continental Europe. It is safe to say that they were familiar with procedural matters, thanks to some of the many ordines judiciarii that circulated in the Anglo-Norman milieu. Here, it is suffic uh, sufficient to remember that André Guron has concluded that one of the oldest ordinances, Ulpianus Bedendo, was written in Scotland. Guron was able to argue as much because of a series of procedural formulas um, whose relationship with the Ordo is attested in two manuscripts that mention a King David Inclite recordationis et vive memorie. Uh, a partial and incomplete copy of this order uh, is still preserved in Edinburgh. The first question on which the arbiters consulted Innocent III, whether the defendant can challenge the plaintiff before an arbiter, was of great legal sophistication. There was no explicit answer in the sources of the Corpus Iuri, Iuris Civili, and the subject had attracted the attention of jurists only from the last decades of the 12th century. The technical te terminology, reconvenire, reconventio, appeared quite belatedly in Johannes Bassianus among the civil law glossators and in Puguccio among the canonists. Among the ordines judiciari, it would seem that the first to deal with the subject matter was the Practica Legum et Decretorum by Guillaume de Lochamp, probably composed in northern France in the year 1183-1189. The author frames the theme within the category of mutue acciones. Around those years, the title the Mutuis Petitionibus also appeared in the Breviarium Extravagantium by Bernardus. Furthermore, it was a debated question whether it was possible to produce new documents after the Publicatio Attestationum. In the present case, 
The problem is connected with the other issue concerning the value of the document instrumentum bearing the seal of, a, of, a, of, a, of the king. When the witnesses mentioned in the document were by then deceased, evidently, the arbiters knew that the decretal of Alexander III addressed to the Bishop of Worcester in 1167, in a fragment of which the pontiff had denied any probity value to the instrumenta whose witnesses were deceased, unless the, the documents had been drawn up by a public authority, manus publica, or had an authentic seal. From the 1170s, the fragment in question was included in several collections of decretals with the incipit scripta vero. For the jurists, the provision of Alexander III became a central text in the uh, elaboration of the theory of public or authentic deed. Perhaps Alexander III the third decretal was not known to the author of the All Ordo Urpianus De Edendo. But this author appears well aware that full evidence must emerge from the cross examination of written documents and testimony of suitable witnesses. In the last decade of the 12th century, however, the subject matter was dealt with in Ricardus Anglicus Ordo Judiciarius and shortly after. Uh, in Bernardus Papiensis Summa Decretalium. Both were widely disseminated works that our arbiters could have well known. On these uh, legal issues, the arbiters doubted of the value to be attributed to the seal of King David and found difficult to recognize in the document a scriptum produced by the Manus Publica. In short, four difficult legal problems emerged from the controversy. Innocent III responses were the result of investigation on issues debated in the schools. First, the principle that the defendant can reconvene the plaintiff before the same judge is not applicable when the judgment is evolved to, is devolved to the arbiters and the specific right to reconvene the plaintiff was not mentioned in the compromise. Second, both parties have the right to produce documents even after the publication of the testimonies and before the final sentences. The, uh, third, the arbiters must investigate whether the custom of the place, consuetudo approbata, may give to the instrumentum regis the character of an instrumentum authenticum. In our specific case, the words of Innocent III could lead the arbiters to a positive solution. Indeed, the pontiff noted that King David had been a person of such great honesty that his documents possessed the highest authority in Scottish lines. This is contained in uh, this um, uh, fragment of the decretals um, put in uh, the title De Fide Instrumentorum. On the last doubt, Innocent III replied briefly that the case had to be decided in with a single sentence. As in the case of the decretal nuper, the inclusion of the decretal cum delectus in the books of the law of the church had a double historical significance. The Scottish judicial practice had first of all led the parties involved to think of difficult legal issues. In turn, a solution to those issues had to be found by the Roman pontiff, who was called to give his authoritative response on the doubts that, that emerged from the legal practice. Sub subsequently, once it was included in the collection studied by the jurists, the decretal fed, uh, fed into the learned uh, disquisition of many canon lawyers on the various themes dealt with in, uh, in it. In the guise of a conclusion, since the end of the 12th century, 
Scotland was immersed in the processes of diffusion of the culture of the use comune in Europe. I think that in Scotland, nothing substantially different happened from what was happening in other geographical areas, areas that may appear peripheral to the scientific centers from which the culture of the use comune radiated. Something very similar happened in Sicily, from Sicily to Scandinavia, from the Iberian Peninsula to the British Isles. The culture of the Jus Comune was a force shaping from inside the life of law in Scotland. The norms, legal categories, and principles of the Jus Comune provided a guide for the, for the interpretation of the customary law and for the definition of an orderly judicial practice. For this reason, the early 14th century, in the early 14th century, the mysterious author of Regium Majestatem found it natural to make a rational use of, of the Romano canonical law to connect his main source, Lambert, with the Scottish legal experience of his time. What allowed these allowed the treatise to establish itself as one of the law books of, of the realm of Scotland. For the same reasons, a jurist of the 17th century as John Skeen thought of doing something useful by retracing in his annotations the threads linking the treatise with the legal and doctrinal sources of the Utrumque use. Skeen accomplished this activity in awareness that it would reveal the communio et differentia subsisting between the jurisprudentia scotica and the scientia of the jus civile. A communio that did not cancel the differentia, as well as the differentia was placed within the horizon of the communio, without which Skeen's scientific and practical sort choice would not make sense. The main purpose of my research was to show that the law of the decretals and the ecclesiastical jurisdiction were the primary vehicles, though not the only ones, in the process of transmission of the culture of the use comune in Scotland, two centuries before the foundation of the University of St. Andrews. The formation of a common legal heritage in medieval and modern Europe is to be understood for what it is, the establishment of a culture of, of a cultural framework within which the peculiar legal developments of the various European nations found their place. The international circulation of students, the European dissemination of the books of the use comune and their use in the practice of the courts could not be explained Otherwise, at the end of the 17th century, Lord Stair's institutions of the law of Scotland represent an exemplary testimony of the European process of formation of national laws, which were presented under the label of jus patrium or jus odiernum. In the first title of the institutions, Stair identifies the common principles of law and traces the relationships between these principles and the law of Scotland. Stair descends from the apex of divine law, natural and positive, through reason, equity, and the law of nations to civil law, feudal law, and canon law. As it is known, unlike other authors, Stair argues that civil, canon, and feudal laws did not have binding legal force in themselves. Nevertheless, they were received in Scotland as examples in as much as they offered fair and useful solutions. But if in this perspective Stair excludes that the jura communia could be considered as positive laws, at the same time, he notes with great lucidity 
the process of attraction that the use comune exercised in the, on the sources of the use proprium, specifically on customs. Our customs, are they, as they have arisen mainly from equity, so they are also from the civil canon and feudal laws from which the terms, tenors, and forms of them are much borrowed. And therefore, these, especially the civil law, have great weight with us, namely in cases where a custom is not yet formed. Since the bonds between customs and the use comune are located on the level of contents, tenors, terminology and legal categories, terms, and shape of legal institution, institutions, forms, the use of the use comune is necessary for the application of the sources of use proprium, which is what Baldus had said three centuries earlier when he spoke of the virtus attractiva of the use comune. As regards canon law specifically, Stare links, his, links it to the authority of the bishops of Rome rather than to the authority of the, of the church. So much that he hopes he opts for the expression pontifical law. The author identifies the main fields of application of canon law in the destination of goods for charitable purposes, in the protection of orphans, in the wills of the deceased, and in marriage law. Those matters were included in the jurisdiction of the church for their holiness. Stair concludes by noting that so deep had this canon law been rooted that even where the Pope's authority is rejected, yet consideration must be had to these laws, not only as to these by which church benefices have been erected and ordered, but as likewise containing many equitable and profitable laws, which because of their weighty matter and their being once received, they may more fitly be retained than rejected albeit within the paradigm of reception, which is seen as the basing, the basis of the rooting of canon law into the law of Scotland, Lord Stair's words are a clear recogni rec recogni recognition of the role of canon law as a force that helped shaping the contours of Scots law. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.